But uh, we want to continue in this series. This is part four. And uh, over the last few weeks, we kind of talked to you guys about different uh, ways that we can reconcile our relationships. And hopefully you begin to reconcile your relationships. And uh, it, just for you guys who are trying to guess, we are not talking about marriage today, okay? Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we may deal with it a little bit, but we're not uh, focusing specifically on marriage. But we want to talk about relational reconciliation, and it's called relational relationship levels. Say levels. levels. There are levels to this. And so um, in pursuit of relational reconciliation, uh, we must learn to know where uh, people are positioned in our relational sphere, our relational hierarchy. Um, not all relationships are created equal. Not all relationships are equal, okay? And so uh, not when we understand that, um, we won't put unrealistic expectations on people in our lives because where, where there's a difference between your expectation and the person's reality, that gap is called frustration. Yeah. And so we are frustrated with people that may not deserve our frustration. And it's because we did not put them at the right level in our relationship hierarchy, okay? And so this often will cause us to have relational pain when we don't properly put people in the slot in our lives. Um, today, so today we're going to talk about what uh, my wife and I have identified just through our years of training people relationally and training leaders. Um, one, one of the things that, that was my major in school, leadership. And so one of the things that I developed was called a relational triad. Uh, say relational triad. So let, let me give you the definition for those of you who are taking notes. Hopefully all of you are taking this. All of you have a relational triad, and this is a relational triad. Here's the definition. A relational triad, it's the three distinct heart spaces where we place people we have relationships with. It's the three distinct heart spaces where we place people we have a relationship with. All of us have these heart spaces, and we've narrowed it down to Three. Now, within these three, if I was to draw a, um, a graph, there's, you know, pop offs of these. But these are the main three, the foundational three relationships and heart spaces that we have. So we're going to just dive a little deeper into all of the heart spaces, but we're just going to skim over them real, real quick right now. So the three spaces are leadership, friendship and mentorship. So those are the three distinct heart spaces that make up this relational triad. And as we move along this morning, we are going to use David as an, an amazing example of how he flowed in those three distinct heart spaces of the relational triad. There are several important relationships that, uh, that are discussed in the Bible that David has that function within that relational triad um, in a leadership sense. He served under the leadership of Saul and um, and so we get to see in the Bible how he how he makes decisions how he lives and how he functions under that relationship he has a friend a best friend a best friend that's like a brother and even closer named Jonathan my brother's name Jonathan it is congratulations Thank you. you have a Jonathan <laughs> And then he has a, a, um, a mentorship relationship um, or a position of authority over Solomon. So we're going to talk about those three different spaces this morning. So what are those three spaces? Leadership, friendship, and mentorship. These are all flowing in your life. Notice that they are directional. That's up, alongside, and down. These are the three dimensions of our triad, relational triad. So let's look at the three distinct spaces. We're going to start with leadership. Leadership because it is the first uh, level that all of us should really embrace, which uh, a lot of people have a disdain for leadership yeah. in our culture now. And so they don't embrace leadership. They, they want to, everyone wants to lead. And I have a statement that I always say, don't tell me who you're over until you show me who you're under. Because a lot of people could say, well, I'm submitted to this person, I'm submitted to that person. But then in their walk, they're really not. 
They're really not following or being guided by leadership. And so let's look at leadership a little more in depth from the life of David. So from 1 Samuel 18 and 5, um, we're just going to read the scripture. It says, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. And I decided to stop right there because I really feel like that portion of scripture really um, embodies David's relationship with Saul. And it's a recurring theme in their relationship because David, whatever Saul came at him and asked, he did it. Even if he maybe didn't agree with it, Mm -hmm. even if he, you know, didn't understand it, he did it and he did it successfully. Um, He demonstrates honor for the position of leadership that Saul had over him. And guess what? God blessed David for maintaining that honor, even when Saul turned on him. Now, that's that's something hard to do. I don't know yeah. about you, <laughs> but to know that you're in a position um, of when, when, that somebody's in a position of authority over you and they don't have your best interest and you still choose to serve them in the way that God has called you to. God blessed David over and over and over, which is part of the reason why Saul hated him so much. Yeah, <laughs> because he couldn't, understand. he couldn't understand why God favored David so much and And the key is, even when David had opportunities for revenge, even when he had opportunities to kill Saul, because Saul was trying to kill him, he chose to honor Saul because he still had that position of leadership over him and he spared his life. Yeah. And so Hebrews 13, 7 tells us this. It says, remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives. And follow, say follow, Follow. the example of their leadership. True leadership, you can't be in true leadership until you're good at fellowship. Can't be. So everyone always asks me, say, say, Pastor Bitch, how how do you do church? I said, "Um, I don't have any new ideas about church. I just take what people have done and put 24s on it. 24s that keep on moving. Spinners. Spinners. That keep moving. (laughs) And uh, what what I do is I just take it. And so when we look at the life of David, David is exemplifying that leaders are people who give spiritual, emotional, and psychological weight in our lives that help us develop to our full potentials. Leaders push you. Leaders, watch this, celebrate you. But watch this. Leaders also correct you. Leaders also um, come into your life and they'll, they'll assess your life and they're able to see things in you that you may not necessarily see in yourself and they'll draw things out of you. So next week, it's cool. Don't miss next week. It's going to be cool. We're going to be roaming through Rome. We're going to be roaming through Romans with three of our up and coming leaders in this church and they're going to preach next week. And I just dropped it. To, I said, y'all preaching next week. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, y'all preaching next week. One of them had never spoken before in their life. And I'm like, hey, look, I see it in you. My job as a leader is to draw it out of you. And we're going to pull it out of you. And we're going to give ex- uh, opportunity for people to grow. And so when you have leaders in your life, sometimes it, it makes you uncomfortable when they challenge you. I have uh, people that I lead that um, I always call them and I'll go, so how things are with your wife? And they'll go, oh, it's good. I'm like, you're lying. (laughs) How do you know I'm lying? Because I asked your wife first. (laughs) (laughs) Now go fix it. You know, like I'm a challenger. Why? Because I carry that weight in their lives as a leader. And so John C. Maxwell says this, leadership is not about titles, position, or flow charts. It's about one life influencing another. The Bible says as iron, what? Sharpens iron. So does another man sharpens another. We can't all, listen, we are all, um, Miles Monroe, who is an amazing leader, I got a chance to spend a little time with him before he passed away, and uh, he says, you know, it's a misconception that you're, you're born a leader and leaders can't be developed. 
All of us are leaders. And, and his principle was, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're a leader. I'll say that again. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're a leader. That's why it was important that David honored Saul, even when Saul didn't deserve honor. Because David, now we understand when we read the genealogy of Jesus, was the root. They even call Jesus the root of David. The root of Jesse, David, and now it goes on and on and on. And through that lineage, we get the Messiah. His name is Jesus. So we, we, let's maybe give us a little example of um, what, what leadership looks like in your life. Well, I'll say um, I've had many, many leaders in my life, um, and, and leadership is important in different aspects of your life because as, as great as somebody might be in one aspect of your life, they might not be able to lead you in a different aspect. Um, I, I will say my husband is one of the greatest leaders I have ever had in my life in my walk with the Lord. Um, he is the one that led me to the Lord, and he has continued. Hold up. You didn't tell me you was going to go there. Not in front of the people, baby. Not in front. <laughs> About to cry up here. Don't oh. cry. You've, th you've heard this before. This is not new information. <laughs> but it makes me cry every time. <laughs> Jeez. You okay? I'm, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> but, but as, you know, as great as a leader as he is um, for my spiritual walk, he can't tell me how I need to do my job at work. Sure can. <laughs> and so I have to be able to submit to the leadership at my job. Um, and I believe this word is for somebody because some people, you in a position and the leadership at your job, they might be Saul in your life. They might be trying to kill your position at that job. But as a believer, as someone who, um, who claims the name of Jesus, we still have to honor that position. We still have to do what they tell us to. And God will make sure that it is done successfully like David when we, we, when we, do, um, when we do what they are asking us. Um, and so just having different types of leadership in your life helps you become a more well-rounded individual and really, really helps you honor God at your best. Yeah. And for me, I mean, I, I've, I've had uh, just some amazing leaders in my life. Uh, people like uh, Jarvis Crockerham, who was there for us early on, Walter Harris, who saw me, uh, Leonard Tennant, uh, who was crazy enough to ordain a 22-year-old me. <laughs> he saw uh, something that none of us did. Praise yeah, the Lord. Bless it. He's, I don't know what he saw either. You were singing Mariah Carey in church, and <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. It was weird. But, uh, you know, Dr. R.A. Vernon, uh, Mike McClure, yeah. um, Mark Sturmer. I've had some amazing leaders in my life that uh, Dr. Raleigh Washington um, who helped me understand where I'm going. And then right now, even as a pastor of Anchor, I have overseers who I go to who speak into my life. I'm not, I'm not just leading you, but I'm being led. Yes. You know, so uh, it's very important that we keep those layers in our life. So the first layer level is leadership. Let's go to the second level. The second level is friendship. Everyone say friendship. friendship. The Bible says if you want friends, act friendly. <laughs> um, we, we, we need friends in our lives. And so uh, what friends are, they are people who are on the same plane at us, plain as us, and they walk with us through life. So let's look at David and his friendships. So 1 Samuel 18, 3 and 4, it reads, and, Sa and Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belts. So this is just the fact that David took off his equipment and gave it to, to I'm sorry, Jonathan took off his equipment and gave it to David. That's just a symbol of the depth of of their relationship and of the commitment that Jonathan had made to David. Jonathan honored his covenant with David, even at the risk of death, even when Saul realized that relationship. And he said, um, you need to go find him 
you need to make sure that he is dead. Because guess what? As long as he's alive, you will not be king. Yeah. And Jonathan, he warned David at the expense of his own birthright to make sure that David got away and he wasn't killed by his father. I don't know about you, but I want friends like that. Yeah. And I have some friends like that that I'm so grateful for um, in my life. And so that is the type of relationship that everybody needs at some point in their life. Yeah. And so it's amazing uh, that when I look around, we are the most socially connected generation to ever walk the earth. But yet, uh, Pew reports and, and, and most reports put out that we are considered the most lonely, loneliest and depressed generation to ever walk the earth. It's proven fact. We have more people on antidepressants in our generation than ever in the history of the world. But yet we have 3,000 followers. Willie Joe got a million followers on Instagram. <laughs> you need to let me borrow some of them. But um, we have followers and friends and likes and all these things happening. But yet, many of us cry ourselves to sleep because when deep things come up, we have no one we can talk to. It's because we haven't developed true friendships. I, if I was to poll this room and really you know, do a uh, love connect. I mean, what what the marriage game, but it's really the friendship game. How well you know your friend game in this church. Uh, we'll be shocked how much we don't know about each other. Even in this room of this August body of believers, where we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord, we'll be shocked how shallow our conversations are when we're talking to one another. Do we really know? Are we really, really? When you say how are you doing? Those of you know when I ask you how are you doing and, and you say, well, I'm going to look at you again and go, really? Or I'll say, Nin no, you're not. I did it to someone this morning because I, I want that deep relationship to where we can be connected and it has to be a level of intimacy to where into me you see and we don't have to live this life lonely. So we have to have friendship. Uh, this is from an unknown uh, author. He says, a friend is someone who understands your past, believes in your future, and accepts you just the way you are. Understands your past, believes in your future, and accepts you the way you are. That is a friend. The Bible says Jesus is a friend that does what? Stick closer than a brother. We see songs about that. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs you bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Y'all remember those songs? Jesus is a friend. And we can bring it to him. But here it is. Jesus can't be your only friend. Come on. That's good. <laughs> Jesus can't be your only friend. You have to have people that you can talk to. For me, uh, give a few examples of friendships. For me personally, uh, I have my wife, number one. There, listen to me, men. We, we say we're going to hit on marriage a little bit. There is no topic off limit between myself and Tashanti. If I'm tempted, I go to Tashanti. If I'm happy, I go to Tashanti. Some of us, are, we haven't developed a relationship with our wives where we could be 100% transparent. And so now we're robbing ourselves of a friendship. And so we're harboring this thing on the inside of us. I have friendships. Uh, Pastor Kevin, there are things that we talk about that most people are like, man, y'all tripping. <laughs> but he's my friend. I need to talk to him. Donovan Baker, Stephen George, who's watching online, Samuel Hemmings. I mean, I have friends. Come on, somebody. I mean, I was with my, we were out in the driveway this week, and I was talking to Steve. Steve was at my house, and, and we were, uh, I think he was on the phone with Donovan when he pulled up, hung up on Donovan to talk to me. <laughs> but, um, so Steve was in my, in my driveway, my daughter pulled up with her friend, and when she pulled up, they were talking about how great of a friends they are. And, and it was like, oh, me and Izzy, we're best friends. And da 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 Me and Steve was like, guess how long we been friends? 
she, they were like, oh, we've been friends since for four years, three years. I was like, well, we've been friends since kindergarten. <laughs> Try that. <laughs> and, and they were like, wow, how did that happen? And, and we just took the moment to share with them how because of that, those, that friendship, it saved us from a lot of things. Because I would walk up to a line because I was always the leader. And I would walk up to a line and Donovan and Steve then would pull me back. Besides this one time, they let me go in the club first and I got into a fight. Thanks, Sh- Donovan. Shouldn't have been in a club. Shouldn't have been with me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but how about you? So I have a funny story that I wanted to tell about um, friends. And you got to keep me on task because you know how my stories are. Um, but when my husband and I, we had been married less than a year. I was pregnant with Madison with our first daughter. My husband comes home. He said, I found you a friend. I'm like, I wasn't. I'm in a friend making business. I wasn't looking for a friend, <laughs> but okay. He was like, nope, I met this guy and his wife, they just got married and his wife is pregnant too. So y'all going to be friends. I was like, how do you know I would like her? I might not like her. <laughs> and he's like, no, we going to meet him tomorrow. They had planned all kinds of stuff. Um, and so we. Th- the only time in my life I've ever planned anything. Right, the first and last. <laughs> so. They show up at our house. Come to find out we lived in the same neighborhood. They show up at our house, and um, some of y'all might know them, uh, the Trask. I know you know them, Ramiah and Nikola Trask. But um, they, uh, he drops his wife off at our house, and they leave. To get ice cream for pregnant women. five hours, (laughs) they were gone. I don't know this girl from Adam. And so we're like, okay, well, I guess we're friends now. So we sat, we looked at each other, we watched Annie, and, (laughs) you know, we we did end up developing a great friendship, a great relationship, and now looking back, I see how much I needed that friendship in that time in my life. We were both learning to be wives. We were learning to be parents. We went through so many um, milestones in our lives together. Our kids have grown up together, and they have long-lasting friendship, family ships, (laughs) you know, um, from that, but I didn't know in that moment how much I needed that because I had friends but none of my friends were married none of my friends were parents and so I needed a a particular friend for that particular season in my life to help me grow and so it the, the important thing about friendships is that friendships can be seasonal and that's okay yeah that is okay. I have a friend from college, uh, high school and college, Marty, uh, my best friend to this day. Do I talk to her every day? No. But if I call, if she calls, we're there for one another. So it's important to really have those, those types of connections, those types of friendships. Kitty, to this day, I know if I call her, guess what? She's running. And the same for, same for her. If she calls me, I'm running. We have those relationships and those friendships in our lives to, to help us be accountable, to help us grow, and to help us walk into our purpose. And I want to say this. Be careful uh, when friendships end and there's not a problem to keep trying to pursue something. And, and the reason I say that is because, like she said, friendships are sometimes seasonal. And I've never seen a building complain when the scaffolding is taken down. And so we have to be careful. We have to understand reason, season, lifetime. And so um, somebody asked me, you know, Kevin's moving. What happens with that? He's going to be my friend in Dallas. Right. I mean... <laughs> It's just kind of how it works. We won't see each other every day. He won't get on my nerves all the time. I mean, but he's still my friend. Yeah. Now, the season of him being around me every day, that's up. But that doesn't mean that I get angry with him. Hello. That's good. That's good. Because I understand friendship and I understand season. So the first one is leadership. The second one is friendship. The last one uh, in the triad is mentorship. Um, all of us should should be mentoring and i want to use uh this word we should be discipling someone okay mentorship discipling uh our lives are meant to be poured out Mm -hmm. 
And so um, we have to have these multiple levels of friendship leadership, uh, people that we look to. We have to have people that we walk with. And we also have to have people that we are pouring into. So let's look at David and his life with uh, mentoring. So first Kings chapter two, verses one through three. It reads, at the time of King David's death approached, as the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I am going where everyone on earth must go someday. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. Now, that, that's an important um, command that he left for Solomon because he had to make sure that he left instructions and he left a legacy for Solomon he instructed him on how to be successful in his purpose as David had learned throughout his lifetime. Keep the commands of the Lord. Observe the requirements of the Lord. Um, all of those things David knew were, was what allowed him to be successful. And so before he left this earth, he made sure that he was able to pour that same um, information, that same mantle, that same legacy into someone else. That's, that's like I said earlier, we find fulfillment when we pour out what's been poured in. The Bible calls us vessels of honor. But if we're not pouring out honor, there's no more room for more honor. Some of us have become hoarders of our lives. And what we want to do is we want to gather, gather, gather all these relationships. Somebody mentor me. I feel like I need a mentor. I need someone in my life. I need a leader in my life. I need friends in my life. And then when you look at their life, they have no one that they are grooming. And they feel unfulfilled because the third part of your life, it's not functioning correctly. And that's pouring out your life for others. What if Jesus would have came on earth, gathered his disciples, and, and that's it? And he would never poured out his blood for others. What if he would have never given his life for us or leave us something for us? See, when we, when we, when we, when we pour out our lives, we outlive our expiration date. I want to outlive my death. And how do I do that? I give everything I got. I give it, I give it all. I give it all. I give you everything that I have every week. People always ask me, they, they used to say, why do you preach with such passion? I said, man, I want to leave this earth empty. When I leave this earth, I don't want them to say he could have done this or he could have done this. I want them to go, he gave it all. He gave everything that he had. His children was blessed. His, his friends was blessed. His church was blessed. Everything he did, his, his co-workers was blessed. I'm pouring out everything that I have because it's all about leaving a legacy and leaving this life empty. I want to ask you a question. Who are you discipling? Who are you mentoring? Who is it that you're giving away what God has given you? Who is it that around you that you can look around and identify that, hey, look, their lives are better because my life existed. Do you hear me online? You have to find someone. You have to find a Solomon. You, uh, Paul had to have a Timothy. He had to have a Titus. He had to have a John Mark. He made sure that they were pouring out. And we exist today because Jesus poured out his life into the disciples. And they, he told them right before he left, the Bible says he blessed them. And when he blessed them, they were in the upper room. They came out of the room and they blessed others. And those others began to pour out the gospel. They went house to house, breaking bread, sharing the word of God with others. This is how the gospel will continue when we are walking out our mentorship in our lives. 
It may not be in the same environment that you and I do. We, we get the privilege. Well, and, and your life changed recently. When you quit working for me, you just quit one day. But I work in the church. So I pour out spiritually, consistently, sharing what I have, giving everything I got. In, and, 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 and you do the same too, but on your job. Your new position. I was listening to her the other day. She came home. She was wore out. And I saw my wife wore out. And I said, how was your day? She said, the new hires came in today. And so I had to get them settled. I had to teach them what they do today. And what if she would just sit at a desk and say, figure it out? I wanted to so bad. <laughs> Thank God you're more spiritual than me. What if I came to church every week and give y'all a nursery rhyme message and just say, leave here and figure out, figure it out. That could be my message every week. Figure it out. We'll do worship, but then I come up and go, How, are there any lovers of Jesus in the house? Figure it out. I don't think we'll be growing. I don't think we'll develop in the Lord. And I'll leave here. Ask my wife. My biggest heartache is leaving and I go home and say, do you think they got it? Do you think they understand? I ask her that every week, every week. Do you think they got it? Do you think I communicated in a way that they understood? Did they, did they really understand? And, and I, I beat myself up if I feel like I preached over your head or, or I, I didn't give you something that God wanted. And, because it's all about emptying myself. Who wants to leave the earth empty? Parents. Empty yourself into your children. Go, go, go there. No, that's that's exactly where I wanted to go. We, we have to make sure we are pouring into our children at all stages of their life. That that first comes with being a good example because they do what they see. They do what they see you do, not what you say for them to do. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning now in this new, uh, new place I am with my daughters that that relationship has to start to change at some point. We shift from a strong authoritative relationship over our children to um, an influential relationship. And so I feel like I'm now in a place of mentorship with my daughters because one of them, she's an adult, she's 18, so if she decided to roll out today she could um, but I, I really am just in a place to where I want to be that mentor I want to teach them things that they need to know in this aspect of in this part of their lives and really be that influence for them to be able to make good decisions in their lives so we have to make sure we're always influence our children for the good and pouring into them so to sum it up we have to make sure that we have these relationships that we know what they are, whether they're leaders in our lives, whether they're friends in our lives, or whether we're mentoring them or discipling them in our lives. And sometimes they interweave with one another. Like I said, she, she told you, I'm her husband. We walk together, but I'm also her pastor. So there are times where I go, as your pastor, babe, and, and, and y'all think I talk to you guys. I mean, she gets the good end of the pastor, you know, like we're laying there and we're like, you need to because it is. And I stretch her spiritually. Because that's my role as a pastor, as a leader. But then at the same time, after I do that, I go, Bay, are you okay? You know, like I got to check on her because it's my homie. <laughs> got to make sure the homie thing is good, you know? And then we switch and then she leads me. <laughs> and then I'm looking at her because she is, I don't know if you noticed, she's a lot more smarter and articulate than I am. I like, babe, can I say, no, it's not proper grammar. Don't, don't, don't do that. You're going to embarrass us all, you know, and I submit to her. But what if in those moments where she's trying to correct me grammatically, I want to exert, exert my leadership because I'm her pastor. Yeah. 
What if she's trying to be my wife and I'm busy trying to be her pastor? Now that gap creates what? Frustration. You have people in your life you've been frustrated with you need to go apologize to. This whole month been leading us to this one moment right here to where you say, God, I'm reconciling what was lost and what was broken. I'm bringing this ministry of reconciliation into my job. I'm bringing this ministry of reconciliation into my marriage. I'm bringing this ministry of reconciliation into my parenting. I'm bringing this ministry of reconciliation into my friendships with my peers and and those around me. And I'm going to bring the heart of Jesus because here it is. If we're not reconciling, we cannot preach the gospel. People will not hear you unless you have a relationship. The ability to relate. That's what it's all about. That, that, that's, that's, that's what happened when we were courting, when I was stalking you, you know? That's what happened. I had to find something that we could relate to. Yeah. <laughs> she kept telling me no over and over <laughs> and over. Over. What's wrong with you? You didn't hit the Lord. I didn't. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Turn down me. A whole me. A whole me. <laughs> but that's what it's about. It's a passionate pursuit of the heart of God on display in a passionate pursuit for the heart of man. Let me put it in Christian ease. Love God. Love people. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, thy strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's reconciliation. How many of you commit to that? How many of you commit to being messengers of reconciliation? Come on, jump to your feet. Those of you who are watching online, hey, I pray that you commit to reconciliation. Come on, let's give it up for Pastor Tashanti. Amen. Love you, baby. <laughs> Did amazing. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right now. That as we close out this series. That God breaks your heart for what breaks his. And that's his children. That's his people. Leaders, lead. Friends, be friends. Mentors, disciple. Do it all. Get it going in your life. I I want to hear stories of you a great story of of that and like Jared those of you who don't know Jared Jared's amazing and you know he's stepping up and I remember when I first met Jared it was just pastor you know parishioner relationship that Jared came on staff and became pastor staff member but I've watched our relationship evolve and it's becoming a deeper friendship and a kinship And that's maturity. But at the same time, I have to become even more of a pastor and push him beyond where he is and help him understand, hey, look, tomorrow for you and Lydia, and I I tell him all the time, I ask him, and you can ask him, I go, how's Lydia with that? Because I know sometimes when we're being pushed, hear me, husbands, make sure your wife is along for the ride. Husbands, do you hear me? Yes, you are the priest, but you got to have peace. <laughs> so I always ask husbands, especially men in our church, how's your wife with that? Are, are, are they okay with that? Because sometimes they're the litmus test of what can be done. Hello. That's my marriage message for the mom. But come on, just close your eyes and lift your hand right now. Think about all the relationships that can profit from you. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray, God, now that, God, as we go throughout our day, God, that you will give us eyes to see people broken, hurt, maimed, that has been destroyed by relationships. And, God, let us be conduits of your love. Let your love flow through us. Father, a love that will baffle people, that same love 
that confused Saul that David had for him. The same love that compelled Jonathan to lay down his life for David. The same love that caused David to give Solomon all that he had. Father, let us have that in our hearts. Father, let us be reconcilers. Let us be the light of the world that those may that men may see our good works and glorify our father which is in heaven and father i thank you god that you'll give us patience gentleness kindness forbearance mercy compassion hope trust god thank you for those virtues come into our lives and we give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus Christ's name. And everyone that loves Jesus said amen. Amen. Come on, give God the best praise that you have right now. Thank you for joining us for this message. If you'd like to learn more about Anchor Chapel or support our ministries, you can visit anchorchapel.com or follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. Have a great week.